So, I'm going to give just a short talk to talk about how you can analyze streaming data and really almost any kind of data with Apache Druid. So, why do you care about streams? Well, you're here at reInvent, so you probably know what a stream is and you know why you would care. But there's a lot of the things that we can do with this. One is the real-time operations, understanding what's happening in the moment. I've got streams data coming across, so I'm able to see and analyze what's happening in sub-seconds. With Druid, as we'll talk about in a bit, I have true stream ingestion, which means every event goes into that database and can be queried as soon as it goes into the stream into Kinesis or Kafka or whatever stream you're using. So in real life, that's usually about 10 to 20 milliseconds between the event happening and you having it ready for query. That leads us into context-aware decisions. And that's where we get the difference between a real-time analytics database and a stream processor. There's a lot of great stream processors that let you see what's happening in my stream could be Kinesis Analytics, for example, or Spark. But usually, that's only useful if you're putting it in context. So not only what's happening right now, but how does that compare to an hour ago, a day ago, to last year's reInvent, to something else in context? And that lets us make context-aware decisions. We also use this a lot for interactive conversations, so that when you have large data sets, which you're going to get from all the stream data, can I go through it and look through it quickly? And to be able to do that effectively, that means almost every query has to be sub-second. Because if I'm going to go look around large sets, if all I get is a spinning wheel of death, it's not very useful. So, few examples of who's doing this in the real world and how you may be actually using it indirectly right now. So one example is Thousand Eyes. Thousand Eyes is a great example of an observability company. They put lots of sensors and open telemetry data, pull it all back, and let you on demand see what's happening in your systems, whether it's on the cloud, off the cloud, multi-cloud, whatever. They're using the Druid to be able to present these dashboards. Because one of the other things about Druid is it's very high concurrency. I can run thousands, tens of thousands of concurrent queries on a Druid database, which is good, because if you're a thousand eyes, you don't know how many customers are going to do a query at any given time. Doesn't matter with Druid, I can hit as many as I need. Atlassian is another fun one. Anybody here use Atlassian, Jira, Confluence? Several of you. Whenever you open Confluence, you notice it says, here's what you've been doing, and here's what's trending. That's actually a Druid query happening by Confluence on the back end. If you're a Jira or Confluence admin, you can hit the analytics button and get all these real-time dashboards to see what people are doing. So Atlassian, it's about 3 billion events a day coming in on the streams for all the Atlassian users that they're analyzing and making available to you in real time. And then, uh, you know, if you're going to talk about streams, you've probably heard of Confluent, which is, you know, founded by the people who created Kafka. They are using this for, uh, what's shown there is an app called Health Plus. So if you're a Confluent customer, they're using real-time analytics to let you see what's happening in your environment. A lot of their customers have 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 topics, and this way you can see quickly how are they operating, what's, what's working, how much data is flowing. All of that is available because we can do real-time analytics. So, why use this? These are the four really big use cases where we see people doing it. One is operational visibility at scale. So, you know, one example uses this in the New York Stock Exchange. As you might imagine, they get network attacks a lot, plus, you know, $3 trillion a day, roughly, in equity trades. They needed a way to be able to keep up with that flow and be able to see and mitigate network and other attacks. 
That's what they're using the database for. Why don't they go use something like uh, Datadog or Splunk? Scale. It, it's just too big for those out-of-the-box products. External facing analytics, like we were just talking about, if you want to present something to your customers, your advertisers, your partners, you don't know the concurrency. So Citrix does that. We mentioned uh, a couple of others. One of my favorites is Nielsen Research. Same thing. They don't know how many people are going to do a query. But with Druid, do as many as they need. Salesforce is using this only internally to Salesforce. But since they have 80,000 employees, that's a lot of people, who can then quickly look at all of the information about operational effects, who's using what service, what kind of uh, performance they're getting, are people getting that right, uh, what they expect to get. And then real-time decisioning. Druid actually originally came out of the ad tech world. So we still have a lot of people using it for advertising or decisioning. In the case of Reddit, this is going to the advertisers. So if you're advertising on Reddit, you can see how many people are in which subreddit or ask a question who's relevant to you. So, you know, for example, if I am interested in reaching Java developers in Los Angeles, we can do real-time queries on how many people on r slash Java dev are in Southern Cal. And we can also do queries on how many people on, say, uh, r slash LA Clippers are also Java developers. So we can pull those together and let people target effectively. Because, you know, advertising, most ads annoy you. A few ads, that's what you want. How do I get the right ad that you want? So that's what we use it for. We know that streaming is everywhere, right? Whether it's Kafka or Kinesis or things based on Kafka like Amazon NSK, Red Panda, other things out there. It's interesting, uh, some numbers came back that if I look at high value data, so that's not like medical scans or TikTok videos, but that subset of data that's actually business data, right? So um, structured data, semi-structured data, even including things like emails and documents, about 20% of that today is actually being streamed. And at current rate and speed, in three years, it'll be more than 50%, even of a much bigger number. Which means streaming, the amount of data that's streaming is growing by about 80 to 100% a year. And, you know, if the sync is the batch, it's not real time anymore. Every database today can ingest streams. But most of them do it with micro-batching. Stream comes in, put it in a batch, then put it in the, in the database. But what did you just do there? You added latency. So now I'm not looking at the data in real time anymore. I'm looking at what happened a minute ago, five minutes ago. That is why you know, we are designed explicitly for streams. So every event immediately available, query on arrival, Guaranteed exactly once delivery. No duplicates, no missing messages. When it shows up late, and that happens a lot in the real world, it gets put in the right place. So we can see that. So very high uh, scalability. And part of our design is as the data comes in, it's written to S3. So it's literally continuously backing itself up. So it, when I have an outage, my RPO is zero. For that matter, there's zero planned downtime in this design. So you're only going to have an outage if everything fails. And even then, you won't lose data. So it's a highly reliable environment, because when you're dealing with streams, you're usually going to be 24-7. Right? It's not a world where you have temp, uh, a downtime. So what makes this real-time analytics? Pretty simple. One is I want to be able to do sub-second queries at scale. So it's at any scale. Could be gigabytes, could be terabytes, could be petabytes. The smallest cluster is uh, running on a laptop. The biggest cluster I know of in production is 15,000 nodes uh, with 400 petabytes of data. 
Can it scale bigger than that? I don't know. I, I, my, my boss won't let me set up a 500 petabyte cluster. There's a budget issue or something. But we're pretty, there's no reason it shouldn't. Second is that high concurrency. Now, technically, any database can be high concurrency if you throw enough resource at it, right? You can always shard it enough or throw extra copies. The point here is it's high concurrency without having to be very expensive. So I'm able to get uh, 100 plus concurrent queries on a single server. And I'm not talking a huge server. I'm talking like uh, an Amazon world, like a C6 extra large, will be able to do 100 plus concurrent queries. And in a medium sized cluster, thousands. And at the same performance as one query. Third one, as I mentioned earlier, both real time and historic. So I can load data with streams, but I can also load data with batch. So you usually do that for the old data or for you know, data that comes in batch wise. So you know, sometimes you might be getting external data that'll show up in files, suck it in with batch. Very fast, very easy ingestion. And again, nonstop reliability. So Druid. In 2010, there was a group of developers at an ad tech company. And they needed a solution that could ingest a billion events in less than a minute and query that billion events in less than a second. So they tried to do that with Hadoop, couldn't do it. And Hive and stuff, couldn't do it. They tried to do it with Postgres, couldn't do it. So because they were young and stupid, they said, we'll just make a new database. How hard can that be? It turned out it's actually kind of hard. But they did it successfully. And because they were in their 20s, they played too much World of Warcraft. So they named it Druid after, because it's a shape-shifting database. In their 20s, they thought that was really cool. Now that all of our co-founders are like in their 30s and have kids, they're kind of you know, a little embarrassed by that name. But it's still a good name. It works well. Within there, um, th this uh, premiered in 2012. There was a great meeting at Netflix, actually in Silicon Valley, that Netflix hosted that had both the Druid creators who described their project and the Kafka creators who described their project. And the Netflix people said, yeah, this is what we need. If you two open source those things, we're going to use them. So Netflix was the first place to actually deploy Kafka and the first place to actually deploy Druid. And there's still a huge user of both of those packages, where today there's more than, well, we think there's more than 2,000 organizations using Druid. It's open source. I don't really know. It's a good guess. And we're using it, as we talked about, across many different industries and for the uses we talked about. So visibility at scale, um, fast-moving event streams, observability, product analytics, um, being able to do use cases for rapid data exploration, being able to do those external analytics, and being able to do that real-time decisioning. Also, a lot of use, uh, our fastest growing area right now is things related to IoT. Because as you might imagine, IoT, a lot of streams, right? All those devices, other stuff have streams coming up. And you often need to be able to make decisions really fast for that to, you know, if I am monitoring an oil pipeline, you know, knowing that half an hour ago it would have been a good idea to turn on the fire extinguisher is not very helpful information. I need to know that right now. So we use a lot of that. So I've been talking about Druid. I work for Imply. What's Imply? You've seen this model before, right? People create open source software, and after a few years they go, hey, maybe we should like, make a company around this. So the people who created Apache Druid founded Imply uh, in 2015. So what does Imply do? Well, it's an interesting thing about Imply. It's not our goal to make money. We're not against making money. We are a company. We're, we're not a nonprofit. But our founders really believe that we don't want to live in a world where only a few big companies control all information. 
And how do you have a world where information is actually owned by the people who should have it, open source, and have a strong and active and developing open source community? We want open source to win. The purpose of Imply is to help open source win, particularly around open source Druid. So let me make this clear. Open source Druid is the fully functional version of Druid. It's not like we have a crippled open source version than a good version you can pay for. But if you choose to pay us, there are things that we can give you in addition to open source. So one of them is a commercial distribution with enhanced security. Because when you use open source, you have to install the, 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 all of the dependencies and the other pieces in there. If you buy the implied version, it's all prepackaged. And we add some extra security pieces that are not in open source. And why are they not in open source? Because they're not open source security. They're, they're commercial pieces. We also offer a couple of versions of cloud deployment. One of them is a full database as a service. So we call that Polaris. So that's, as you'd expect, everything is consumption based. You, know, you pay based on how many queries you're running and how much data you're ingesting. By the way, free trial, don't even want a credit card. If this is something that interests you, go to imply.io, you'll see a button that says uh, free trial, give it a try if that interests you. Um, we also have what we call hybrid manage, because some of our customers say, I can't run this in your VPC, I need to control all the security, run it in my VPC, so then we'll give you the app on Kubernetes, and we'll do as much management as you want to let us. So if you let us, we'll manage the security. We'll manage other pieces. But it's your choice how much you let us in the door. And we added some management tools on top that do performance management easier to deploy, that report back not the data. We never see your data, but the metadata, so that when you call us for tech support, we don't have to waste two hours explaining what's going on. We can pull up and see what's happening in your environment. And then finally, support, right? Druid has maybe the best support in open source. There's a very active Druid Slack. The average response to an open source request for help with Druid is about 20 minutes. But that's still open source, right? If you, if you're using open source and it goes down, you're just hoping somebody will help you. So if you're paying imply, there's people who are paid to help you. And 24-7 you know, support, including right up to the original creators, who are usually not working the support lines. But if you have a problem that's tough enough, you'll have some of the people who, who are writing the project and, and running Druid doing that. And then the last thing to mention here is this is ready to use on AWS. So it's in AWS Marketplace, both the enterprise version and the Polaris as a service. It inherently connects with Kinesis and uh, MSK. It, uh, all of the ingestion transformation, cool things we do that I didn't get into, like interpolation. So that's automatically smoothing and helping interpolate missing values on streams the sub-second query, the visualization. So again, you can use our visualization, which is built in, or you can use QuickSight or Superset or Grafana or whatever visualization makes sense, so that your data analysts, the applications, the other things that use it are ready to go. So you want to find out some more? Druid.apache.org is where you can get the official for open source Druid. If you want to find out about Imply, imply.io and slash Polaris if you want to write to the free trial. We also have a whole bunch of tutorials, lessons, articles, other how-to things, what we call our developer center. So you can find that at imply.io slash developer. So I was told I had 20 minutes. I am now at 19 minutes and 30 seconds. So I could take one question if anybody has one. <laughs>